What is to be done with the cultural heritage of a people after a genocide? The relics of the civilization they've left behind after they've been taken away and murdered are extremely moving to behold. Whether those relics are banal or whether they are important cultural statements or major beautiful pieces of architecture, the question is, what do we do with this debris of a culture of a people who's been taken away and murdered? There are a lot of difficult questions here, and it's not a matter just of Polish-Jewish relations or just the Jews. These are universal questions which relate to many other cases of great tragedy, catastrophe, and genocide in other parts of the world as well. But this lecture is obviously connected very specifically with the Polish-Jewish issue. But it concerns difficult questions which I don't have answers to. What I want to say this afternoon is to try to hint at the range of the problems and leave it at that uh, with your permission. What I'm going to speak about is southern Poland, sometimes known as Galicia, which was its name in the 19th century. And the photographs were taken by an absolutely top-class British photographer called Chris Schwartz. Um, he made an archive of about 1,000 photographs, of which there are about 75 in the book, which is at the back. And uh, today, we'll see about 100. So I'm going to try to whiz through those photographs fairly quickly. I could spend 15 minutes on each photograph on my commentary, but for the sake of your peace of mind and your afternoon tea and the reception, <laughs> I will try to keep those remar remarks as briefly as possible. In introducing the subject this afternoon then, let me explain uh, why I want to start with this photograph, which expresses, if you like, the complexity uh, of the subject. You can see here a Jewish tombstone. It's written in Hebrew and in Polish. It's dated 1932. The name of the person who is buried there is named Chaim Jakub Abrahama. And it's quite obvious that if there's a tombstone, it must be in a cemetery, by definition. It should be in a Jewish cemetery uh, in Poland. In fact, it is in a Jewish cemetery in Poland, but it's more complicated than that because there is, as you can see, a very wide open space with no other tombstones there. This is the only tombstone which has survived, at least legibly, uh, with its inscription in that entire cemetery. It's now a park. But before it, became a park, before it was a park, it was a German concentration camp. And before it was a German concentration camp, it was a Jewish cemetery. So this is a Jewish cemetery which became a concentration camp where all the stones were dug up and laid flat on the ground to make paving for the concentration camp, and it's now um, an empty space, still, in Jewish law, a Jewish cemetery, but in every other sense, it's just a wide open space. This, ladies and gentlemen, I chose as my, if you like, iconic uh, opening photograph to give you a symbol of the problem of present-day Poland. Many people, many Jewish people, think of Poland as one vast Holocaust graveyard, where there's nothing else there except, except um, uh, the traces, if you like, of the Holocaust. This one surviving tombstone is somehow symbolic also, if you like, of those fortunate or perhaps somehow unfortunate people who survived the Holocaust themselves as people who spent one, two, three, whatever it was, years in Auschwitz or elsewhere and came out alive to tell the tale, and many of them, as you know, still alive. How did they survive? How did it happen? Uh, how to explain it, nobody knows, least of all themselves. Um, we don't understand it. So the first image I'm giving you is the incomprehensibility of the subject. Don't understand it. The people were taken away and murdered. Yes, there are some traces of people. There is a small Jewish community in Poland now, and as you will see, there's a lot of traces of a Jewish past. But what do we make of it, um, and what do we do with it, is very difficult. Let me just um, add one more introductory comment. This lecture is entitled um, In Search of Poland's Hidden Jewish Past. Why is, why is the Poland's the Jewish past hidden? Well, um, there are a number of reasons for that, and I just will, um, um, I'm on the, on the screen for a little while. I'll come explain something about that in a moment, but I won't tell you what that photograph is of, but suffice it to say that what is of the Jewish past is not overground there, it's underground. 
So that's a hint of what that place is. We'll come back to that a bit later on. Nothing to see there anymore, um, and the traces are underground. But under um, 40 years of communist government, which Poland endured from 19, well, the end of the 1940s till 1989, um, there was a state-sponsored anti-Semitism, which came originally from Moscow via Warsaw, or Warsaw via Moscow, um, which actually made a, put a, slapped a taboo, uh, um, sometimes of greater intensity, sometimes of lesser intensity, on Jewish life, teaching of Judaism, teaching of Jewish studies. There was nowhere in Poland you could study Jewish studies as you can at Pepperdine University today. In Poland, under communism, this was not possible. Um, not really. Um, uh, today, on the other hand, 2011, there are more students of Jewish studies at the University of Krakow than there are at the University of London. So to give you an idea of present-day Poland compared with communist Poland, that's just one example of how the whole country has changed. But by today's, in today's perspective, the Jewish past was hidden by, a, by a, an anti-Semitic uh, government. Um, the other reason, or the other main reason why uh, the Polish Jewish past was hidden was because in 1939 um, there were three and a half million Jews in Poland um, uh, um, following on the largest Jewish community Europe had ever known. For centuries Poland had been the center of the Jewish world, the center, the main center of the Jewish world, just as Poland therefore became the epicenter of the Holocaust. Um, the largest Jewish community in the end of the 1920s had become the United States of America. But immediately prior to that, in the early 1920s, it was Poland. Um, uh, Jews had lived in Poland for more than 800 years and had an extraordinarily visible presence in the country. 10% of that population was Jewish in 1939. It's a big percentage. But in many of the cities, the percentage was even larger. Warsaw, the capital, had a Jewish population which was 30%. Um, Krakow, a big town in the south and the former capital of Poland in medieval times, had a Jewish population of 25%. That's big. That's big time. But in the small villages, you could find 40%, 50%, 60%, and even one can find the occasional village with 80% Jews. This was, a, this was not a, a, an obscure uh, population. Uh, this was very, very visible. Jews dressed very visibly Jewish. They had their own Jewish political parties in Poland's national parliament. They had their own sports clubs, their own libraries. They had their own theaters. They had their own charitable organizations. They had what we would call a, a fully fledged and fully functioning civil society uh, of their own, as well as being totally uh, involved uh, during the latter part of the, um, uh, the first half of the 20th century uh, in Polish civil society too. Although towards the end of that, following Hitler's rise to power in 1933, Poland's government became um, uh, very anti-Semitic. But prior to that, there had been good relations uh, between Jews and Poles. Now today, you can find not much more than one half of one percent uh, uh, of uh, um, Jews compared with what there was in 1939. So the Jewish presence is not at all as it was uh, in 1939. Um, except for one very interesting thing, um, which is cemeteries. Um, more than 1,300 Jewish cemeteries in Poland. They've got Jewish communities in maybe 10 places, and there's 1,300 Jewish cemeteries abandoned all over the country, giving proof how of the great spread and density of the Jewish population before the Holocaust came and wiped them out. But, as I've said, there are these surviving relics like Mr. Abrahama's tombstone, and there are Poles out there who are very keen to try to restore the memory and the actuality and the reality of the Polish Jewish heritage. They are documenting it, researching it, renovating it, and restoring it, often with national Polish government help or with local Polish municipal uh, government help. Um, so what I want to speak about, finally I've got to the end of my introduction, you'll be relieved to know, um, um, is 
therefore not a historical account of the history of those 800 years, not even a historical account of the Holocaust, but a contemporary look. This is to imagine you today, looking at this subject today, what you can see and what you can make of what there is today, with that big question, what do we do with everything that's been left behind? 